Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon again. Uh, today's lecture will be about answering your questions and about the homework. Uh, that is the homework that was given to you for the last month and the new homework. Uh, you sent me a collection of questions which were all very interesting. Uh, some of them have to do with the class process, others with Watson and NLP, and then some general technology questions plus some personal questions. So I'm going to answer uh, some of the questions in the first three categories. And for the personal questions, we're going to leave them until I show up in Warsaw, and then maybe in a break of the lectures. Well, after the lectures, I can answer some of those. All right, so if we go to class-related questions. Uh, I have one for you, that is whether you did your homework. So please uh, answer this question. Uh, and uh, from you to me, there is a longer list, so let's go through all of them one by one. But before we do so, let's uh, review what it is that your homework was supposed to be. And uh, that's also going to clarify some of the process questions. So, as you remember, we talked about building elements of the Watson system, so essentially trying to build some of the Watson simulation consisting of uh, several search engines. So, for example, Indri Lucene, Google Search, or Bing API. Uh, we will need to learn a little bit about machine learning. And then we'll try to replicate some of the Watson capabilities, such as uh, question analysis, candidate generation, scoring, and learning how to score. This is where we will use uh, machine learning. And uh, at least we will talk about data preparation and possibly do a little bit of data prep uh, for the system. Now, uh, what I am expecting from the students is some understanding of the, the theoretical material, okay, and some of it uh, you will have to do on your own, uh, but uh, the other part uh, that is going to be equally important will be whatever we do in building a software system. Uh, as you notice, the requirements are a computer with about uh, 4 gigabytes uh, of RAM and about 100 gigabytes of space on the drive. And I think that's going to be sufficient for what we are attempting to do. And so please remember these numbers. So the homework uh, that was for March was to watch uh, the introductory lectures, uh, make sure, making sure that you understand the base theorem, uh, check what's uh, going on in natural language processing, take a look at the architecture of the Watson system. And then the important practical part has to do with the Google Search API. That is, you are supposed to create a custom search engine and run about, say, 100 queries, right? So what we want to do in April, okay, is something very similar to number two. That is, uh, uh, create a Bing API search uh, capability and the instructions will be provided to you later in this lecture and then language search and evidence retrieval possibly using this Bing search API and again I'm going to give you some examples of what I have in mind uh, later in the lecture. Uh, you remember that we talked you know that uh, we're going to that have two ways of participating in this class. So the one way is remotely, which is what we are doing right now, and uh, what you are doing as part of your homework. And the second part is uh, in mid-May when I uh, come to Warsaw. We're going to do some review of the lectures, and we will focus on uh, building as much uh, uh, of the system as it is possible. So uh, the final grade it will be based on uh, and our exam, so I don't know, eight, ten questions, and then the rest of it will be your contributions to building the system. So if you contribute more, you're going to get a better grade. Now, questions. 
So these are questions from you to me, all right? And uh, I'm going to read them in Polish, but answer them in English. Nie było nic e, wspomniane o formie zaliczenia przedmiotu, więc moje pytanie, jaka jest forma zaliczenia tego przedmiotu? So, uh, if uh, I understand this question correctly, uh, as I mentioned before, there will be an exam and there will be software contribution which will be evaluated. So, uh, whatever you do in the practical part in the lab uh, will be part of your grade. Uh, second question, w jakim języku będziemy programować? Uh, we will do it in Java because most of the libraries we're going to be using uh, are in Java. However, uh, some of the search engines can be called from C++ or C Sharp. So if you know how to wrap it up in a way that can be called from Java, that would be also acceptable. Uh, to do some of the work in uh, C Sharp and C++. I, I'm fine with that, but you're going to be on your own since I don't think I can help you with that particular part. Uh, third question. I'm not good at programming. I have never programmed in Java. Would it be possible to use C Sharp instead of Java during our classes in Poland? Uh, so the answer is uh, partly, but uh, I still want to do most of this programming in Java. Uh, so this brings us to the fourth question. Jakie techno technologie i biblioteki Java są wykorzystywane przy projekcie Watson? Czy możliwe jest pisanie w innych językach programowania jak C++ czy C Sharp? So uh, essentially when we talk about programming languages here, uh, I chose Java because I am familiar with it. Okay, I'm definitely not familiar with C++. I have some basic understanding of C++. But uh, the point is that uh, all three languages are quite similar in syntax. And uh, the Eclipse environment should help you find the right function or method. And I will be explaining in class during the, you know, the practical part of the class, what Java uh, classes you will need to use, okay, and then finding the right methods shouldn't, shouldn't be too difficult. The, you know, the style of programming is very, very similar, so I don't think you should worry about it. Uh, the uh, next part of the question about uh, what Java libraries were used, okay, so uh, in the Watson project, uh, Indri jars, okay, so essentially Java libraries for Indri search engine, for Lucene search engine, for UIMA, these are the main uh, libraries besides uh, standard Java libraries. And then uh, uh, other libraries that were used is Hadoop, okay, which was used for data preparation. We will not use uh, Hadoop in our class. And Weka was used for machine learning in the offline fashion. And we're going to use Weka, but uh, I am not sure how much of it uh, will require knowledge of Java since uh, Weka comes also with the uh, graphical user interface. So essentially, you can do point and click, and you can do your data preparation for Weka in any format you want. I don't care. Uh, so the other question is whether it would be possible to write what's on this in C++. Uh, the answer is yes. Okay, so you could uh, do it in C++ because there is a C++ version of UEMA and UEMA was very important in Watson. Uh, for C Sharp, I think the answer was, uh, is no. It was never ported to UIMA. Uh, also, I mean, the, the team is not familiar most with, I mean, most of the members of the team were not familiar with C-sharp as far as I know. So it would be, you know, some uh, amount of time wasted trying to learn the peculiarities of this language. And if you want very high accuracy, you have to know, you have to know the details of the language. If you want to get uh, some understanding of how the system works, I think we're going to be fine with uh, with just the basic knowledge of Java. 
A next question. Czy jest inne środowisko poza eklipsem, który można pisać w Javie? The answer is yes. There is. There are environments that you can that you can use, but uh, I cannot help you with the other environments. And uh, if you are asking these questions, it means you are not familiar with them either. So uh, it means that there are two choices. Either you learn this new Java environment by your own and, uh, and well enough for you to perform in class, or otherwise you should use Eclipse because that's where some help is going to be available. So, uh, so it is it is your choice. I strongly advocate Eclipse. Uh, next question. Okay. Uh, czy będziemy programować na jakąś konkretną maszynę? So the answer is no. Uh, that is, uh, the programming is going to be machine independent. Uh, we will probably do it on Windows 7 or Windows 8, and uh, you can do it on your laptop or you can do it on the lab PC, uh, as long as you know some basic requirements like uh, 4 gigabyte of RAM are there. Uh, next question. Otóż będziemy programować na superkomputery, ale jaka będzie docelowa maszyna, na którą to będzie wszystko tworzone? A, I czy różnica w hardwareze dużo będzie zmieniała na nasz, naszym pro, programowaniu? To jest trochę tam to zdanie jest nie takie. All right, but I will answer in English. So uh, we will not be programming for a supercomputer, and uh, I will explain sort of why we can do it in a minute. All right, we're going to be programming, as I said, about uh, on a laptop or a PC, and that's going to be perfectly fine. Now, uh, in terms of the hardware, Java is platform independent, so the libraries uh, could be used on both the Windows and Linux machines and they can be used on, as I said, on a PC. They could be also used uh, on, on a supercomputer. For example, if you want to do some Hadoop computation. Okay, but uh, uh, if you remember, I mean, a uh, little bit uh, of the discussion of the Watson architecture, uh, and we're going to go to the next slide in a minute, but the bottom line is this, that uh, if you have a lot of data and you do, you generate a lot of candidate answers and you do very detailed processing of supporting evidence for every candidate answer and you want very fast answers in the supercomputer, right? But uh, in our case, uh, most of these conditions will not be met. That is, I do not expect us to achieve, you know, what's on 80% accuracy in, in correct answer in the first place. Uh, we will be using smaller data sets and uh, we do not have a requirement to answer within a second, right? So so we can we can afford to wait say 20 seconds for, for an answer and then I, I believe that we're gonna get most of our answers in five and ten seconds. Uh, so uh, there is also uh, empirical evidence in supporting this view, that is, we did port uh, Watson to a small workstation and also it ran on my up, uh, laptop at some point, but uh, on a workstation with the full data set it took about 20 minutes, between 20 and 30 minutes on average to answer the questions, obviously, that wasn't viable for, for the Jeopardy game. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when we were working with some experiments on the order of uh, 1.5 gigabytes of data, and in this case, uh, with smaller number of scorers, we basically achieved real-time answers uh, on the laptop with probably about 4 gigabytes of so RAM, maybe 3. So let's 
so we're going to look at it in Sorry about that. Right. Okay, so we covered this. All right, so let's let's look at the Watson architecture. So what you see here is okay, a question coming in. All right, and then uh, there is a number of steps that are happening before the answer and the confidence of the answer comes out. All right, so this is this is the pipeline. And uh, what is happening is that uh, the hypothesis generation, that is candidate answer generation, <coughs> is achieved through search. So what it means is that after some basic analysis of the question, impossible decomposition, which we don't have to go into right now, the main strategy is to take the words of the questions, pass it to the search engine. Okay, so here we have the search engine. And this search engine will give us candidate answers in the form of the titles of articles that uh, discuss these particular concepts in the questions. Okay, so we're going to see it in an example uh, with uh, common code later in in this class. But essentially, if you are asking a question about, you know, uh, an infectious disease that uh, makes you miserable and uh, the, where you have a runny nose and some other symptoms popping, uh, it is likely that uh, Wikipedia article on common cold will cover these symptoms and therefore uh, you will be able to generate the candidate answer, common code, as one of the candidates. Uh, obviously, there are many other articles that can mention the runny nose and uh, feeling miserable and uh, a couple of other things. For example, sinusitis, and this would be another candidate answer. All right? So, what has to happen next is that evidence for each of these candidates have to be uh, scored, okay, along multiple dimensions. All right, so to do that, what we do is very simple. Is uh, in the Watson architecture, we take uh, the two answers, we plug it back in the question separately. So we have common cold and then the collection of symptoms. We have sinusitis and collection of symptoms. We submit these two queries to the search engines again, and we get the passages which contain the, these words, or at least many of the words of the query. And then we look at these passages, and based on what we see, that is what machines can score, uh, we decide which of these two answers is a better answer. Okay, so this is, this is essentially how, how this works. So if we have only two answers, I mean, we, if we generate a very small number of candidate answers, we really don't need to do, uh, to do much. Uh, we can almost do it uh, without any thread, multi-threading, all right? But if you have uh, many more answers, then obviously you need to do much more computation, okay? So this is uh, the simulation of the computation. So you have multiple interpreta interpretations of the questions. Uh, you have uh, about a hundred of sources in Watson. You generate a hundred possible answers. For each answer, candidate answer, you generate, say, a thousand pieces of evidence. And then you have to score them in uh, 400 dimensions. All of that requires really a big machine. But since the number of scores we're going to use is much smaller, and uh, we don't have to generate a hundred candidates, we probably gonna do uh, quite reasonably well on using uh, the PC. All right. uh, so let's go to other questions. Uh, what was the biggest problem in creating application uh, LLP applications in Watson? So, uh, I would say that the biggest problem was the lack of question-answer pairs. So, for Jeopardy, we had an archive of 200,000 uh, questions with answers that I think we used in the process 
about 50,000 uh, for various forms of testing and uh, building the, the, the machine learning models. So that wasn't uh, the case uh, for medical question answering, although a smaller set of a few thousand questions was available uh, from a competition called uh, The Doctor's Dilemma. But, uh, for example, for uh, customer service support, we had to create some of these questions. I mean, we had very small numbers from FAQs and, uh, and some archives, but they were not properly cured and, uh, and the lack of, you know, and the lack of question answer pairs in general is very, uh, very limiting for, uh, for the Watson model of question understanding and answering. Uh, next question. Uh, w jaki sposób supercomputer Watson uczy się nie korzystając z internetu? Okay, so uh, Watson's knowledge consists of uh, textual resources, okay, and the biggest of these resources is uh, Wikipedia. Okay, the current uh, Wikipedia uh, has over 4 million different articles. I think at the point where we were using it in Watson, the number was uh, perhaps around 2 million, uh, and we, uh, maybe we didn't use the call the whole Wikipedia. In addition, uh, IBM licensed additional additional resources, okay, the additional text sources. So, uh, two additional encyclopedias, song lyrics, uh, were licensed. Uh, the third item was uh, corpus preparation and expansion. So, we uh, crawled some of the resources from the internet, uh, and that was done by uh, taking, say, a title of a popular Wikipedia article, uh, doing an internet uh, search query, and then getting the data uh, about this particular topic from the internet, and then scoring the passages uh, uh, on resemblance between, say, Wikipedia article and particular uh, uh, paragraph of uh, a web page, for example, covering the White House or President Lyndon Johnson or some other topics, right? And uh, it turns out that we didn't need the whole internet and that 60 gigabyte of text, which is what uh, went into Watson, was actually enough to uh, win the Jeopardy game. Uh, next question. Czy istnieją jakieś praktyczne zastosowania inteligentnych komputerów w zakresie bezpieczeństwa sieci? So the answer is, uh, you know, the way I'm reading this question is, is there any NLP uh, based uh, uh, wait, there is another question. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna answer the question uh, in a second, all right. I, I got a question a moment ago. So let me just answer this, these uh, questions on this page first, and then we're going to go uh, to, to, to the question that came to the chat. So uh, the way I'm reading the question about uh, network security is that, uh, you know, is there NLP used in this space? And the answer is yes, but not widely. I think this is something that's coming, though. Uh, it's not my, my area, so I cannot uh, tell you too much about it, but I will cover an example in the next lecture if, you know, if other uh, students have interest. So that there are some interesting examples and the, the topic can be useful in discussing stuff like uh, vector space models. Uh, the next question on this page is Słówko uh, Ale działa dla nieświadomości jako kasownik, jak można je zastąpić, aby wypowiedzieć zdanie w właściwy sposób. Uh, well, uh, uh, people argue about uh, the, you know, how the word but or ale in Polish should be used. The typical advice is to use two sentences. However, there is nothing wrong with 
the word itself. I mean, people have been using it. It has, uh, I mean, it has certain meaning. Uh, in some circumstances, it may be inappropriate, but uh, but obviously, uh, if there was no good linguistic reason for using the word, uh, it would disappear from from the language. So. I'm not sure that I'm answering sort of the intent of this question. However, all right, uh, uh, the way I read it is that uh, uh, you okay, you don't want to convey two uh, contradictory messages at the same time. On the other hand, okay, almost. In almost any situations, there are positive and neg positives and negatives, so you need to convey it. So, so if you use two sentences, you can emphasize, you know, what is what your position is, uh, and then later say, okay, there are also counter arguments for for this position. In some cases, this might work better than using the word uh, but or other. All right. So now let's go. Came uh, from. Uh, uh, from the chat, uh, but there are also fake answers text in Wiki, text in Wikipedia. So can we trust what some answers based on Wikipedia? Uh, good question. So uh, Wikipedia quality indeed uh, can vary, but uh, people have checked uh, the quality of Wikipedia entries, and in general, the quality is quite good. And uh, the fake answers do not usually have too many followers. That is, you know, some uh, false facts that are occasionally put in Wikipedia are very quickly uh, removed for the topics that people care about, which is, say, politics, history, and first of all, entertainment. So anything you know, related to entertainment is checked by multiple people. And, uh, and rumors are properly discarded. So in general, Wikipedia is a reliable source, but it wasn't the only source that we use. So let's uh, proceed to the next question. So the next category is sort of general questions. Czy przy obecnych parametrach technicznych maszynę Watsona można traktować jako fundament do powstania bardziej złożonej myślącej sztucznej inteligencji? Czy sztuczna inteligencja i konwersacja z komputerem w języku naturalny Równą, równym stopniem do, o równą stopniem do konwersacji między ludźmi jest możliwa z wykorzystaniem klasycznego superkomputera. Czy zdolność prawdziwej nauki i powstania inteligencji nie wymaga mózgu? A wiedza to nie inteligencja, a język naturalny jest na tyle elastyczny, że jedno pytanie można zadać na następnych sposobów. Sztuczna inteligencja może naprawdę zaistnieć dopiero przy wykorzystaniu biotechnologii. Wow. Very good questions, but obviously we don't know uh, answers to these questions. So first of all, I mean, the, uh, what's an approach is most likely not sufficient for building a real AI system, right? So. Uh, there are two reasons for it. Okay? One is that uh, every advance in AI, okay, in computer science, uh, wasn't sufficient. Okay? I mean, people speculated that, you know, that, uh, say, a rule-based system will do it, yes. Uh, if we have a chess-playing machine, we, it's going to be really the intelligent, machine intelligence will be coming right after that. Uh, uh, there was quite a bit of speculation after Watson. And uh, now there are speculations that say deep uh, learning using neural nets might be, you know, such a thing. 
Uh, however, given the history, I mean, we can uh, uh, make bets that uh, that that's not going to be sufficient. Okay, what's going to be sufficient, we don't know. I mean, that that is a problem that we don't know how to solve. And the second reason, okay, besides the, the history, is that uh, Watson's uh, natural language understanding capabilities were really quite limited. Okay, they were better than what people had tried before, but uh, nevertheless, Watson had no awareness of its own existence. It uh, couldn't uh, answer some uh, more complicated questions. So, for example, uh, answer that Watson couldn't speculate on any causal relationship to why, you know, uh, why is sky blue, all right? Although maybe this question could be answered by uh, quoting a Wikipedia article. Uh, however, Watson had no real uh, model of, uh, of a paragraph of text. Okay? It was constructed to answer questions that could be answered uh, using a word or a phrase or a couple of phrases, right? Uh, even uh, for applications, uh, again, the, you know, the, the way Watson works is that you have to uh, prepare your sources in such a way that the answers are given as, a, say, a paragraph of text that is, describes how to do certain procedures, right? So, and uh, also logical cap capabilities in the original Watson were quite limited. Uh, my colleagues at IBM are trying to add to some of these capabilities right now for, for medical diagnosis, but uh, nevertheless, we are still far away uh, from uh, from real AI, and then uh, finally, okay, uh, there is a good argument, okay, which you know most of the computer scientists don't believe in. Uh, however, some of the linguists do. That uh, the argument is that the language is a function of the human brain and body, and essentially the ultimate language understanding has to do with the. Uh, hormones in our blood and uh, more with the hormones in our blood and less with, you know, with uh, a logical model that we can create. Uh, then uh, there are some other questions, okay, so we're going to leave them for another time uh, that have to deal with the amount of money invested in supercomputers and uh, investment in Poland, so I, I don't have answers to these questions. I think that that uh, could be a good uh, question try to answer by uh, building a search engine and scoring a result, so that could be part of, you know, we can add it to the list of Jeopardy questions that we're going to be playing with. Uh, and then the last two questions are sort of more personal, so I have I mean, I, I don't think that's a proper place for me to put it in a technical lecture, but I will be happy to answer some of these uh, when when I come to Warsaw during the break. All right, so now I mentioned before the new homework, all right, so what I want you to do is to play with the Bing API. Uh, the instructions are here in points one to seven. Uh, some of the resources are given uh, in the links. Uh, and essentially what you have to do is to get a, a Microsoft account if you don't have one. Uh, register on azure.com, which is uh, Microsoft Cloud. And then get your Bing account API key okay, by going to to these links, all right? Uh, once you have the Bing API key, which is a string, you can make a list of queries and execute them, okay? And so there is a hint on the next page, all right? So this is what, uh, you know, what you would need if you want to do it in Java. So essentially you need uh, the Apache 
HTTP client fluent uh, library. Uh, you have to prepare your query by replacing uh, the space with the symbol. And then essentially what you do is you define the URL that you want to go to uh, by uh, creating, you know, by taking your uh, by taking your query, so this is the query and putting it as a part of uh, of the URL that you gonna submit to the search engine. Okay, so this is essentially what uh, the, what the procedure uh, would be. Okay, and you're gonna get your results here, all right, as as a very long string. And uh, you should print these results and see if you can split them in some more systematic way because what we will really care about in these results about where the title of the result is and where the text, the abstract uh, of, uh, of the result appears. Because, I mean, these, these are the two elements that we're going to be using uh, to create candidates and then the, the text to be used in scoring also. All right, so to give you a flavor of uh, where we want to be uh, or what we will try to implement uh, during my stay in Warsaw, okay, let's go to an example which uses uh, just plain Google search but explains some of the ideas and it also gives you some idea of, about, you know, how Watson works and why Watson works. So we're going to uh, look at the uh, answer to the question about some of the symptoms. All right. So uh, imagine a Jeopardy question essentially trying to ask you what is a common, where common is in quotation marks, a common nasal viral infection. So we can take the words in this question, uh, pass it to Google, all right, saying that yes, we have to have the word common there and then uh, nasal infection, it has to be viral, yes. And what we get is quite a few results, as we can see, and uh, the top results are given here, which says, you know, CDC gets smart sinus infection, sinus infection, sinus infection, sinus symptoms, acute sinusitis and sinusitis. So interestingly enough, common cold is not among the top five, but it appears, I believe, on the first page, or maybe the first 20. So, uh, so what happens now is that uh, we will take these results, okay, the titles of these results, like sinusitis, signs and symptom causes, okay, so we cut it probably on, on some of these columns or dashes, so CDC would be the first result, sinus infection would be the second result, sinusitis uh, would be the third result, acute sinusitis would be the fourth result, and sinusitis would be the fifth result. And somewhere there, number 10 or, or, or 11 would be, uh, would be common cold, so we would get it. All right? Now, uh, obviously what we want as an answer is common cold. So uh, we would somehow have to make sure that common cold gets promoted to the top answer. And that's the role of scoring, right? So let's look at, you know, what we get, uh, how the scoring is performed. So if you remember from uh, the discussion of the architecture, right, what we have is a question we just went to our uh, sources, okay, in this case it was a Google, uh, the internet source, and we generated hypotheses, okay, so we generated a collection of candidate answers. Some of them are uh, somewhat sensible, like sinusitis and common cold. Some of them are nonsensical, like CDC, Center for Disease Control, right? So, uh, what's has to happen next is that we have to score these candidates. And the way we do it is we, we move to the next phase 
And what we do is we take our query, which was common viral nasal infection, and we add the candidate answer. So we add CBC to this answer. We add uh, uh, sinusitis. Okay, so the first query would be CBC common nasal viral infection. The second query would be sinusitis common nasal viral infection. Uh, query number 11, say, would be uh, common cold nasal viral infection, right? So that's, that these would be the queries. And we go back to the search engines, right? So, uh, let's do that. So now we have uh, executed the query, common cold nasal viral, okay, an infection we have there. And we get common cold symptoms as the first result, sinus infection. But keep in mind that we're going to be looking this time not at uh, the titles. We're going to be looking at the text. So here in the text we have get the facts on common cold causes, virus, symptoms, treatment, sinus infection, sinusitis, sinus symptoms. So in the second paragraph we have, uh, sorry, in the second to the passage we have, has your cold or allergies turned into a sinus infection? The common cold and upper respiratory, respiratory infection is usually called by virus and so on and so forth. Uh, here we have a list of symptoms, common cold symptoms include nasal congestion, there are no post-nasal drip probably. Is it a cold or a sinus infection? Uh, we get again this uh, paragraph from CPC, but this time we care about the, the text, so chronic sinusitis can be called very nasal polyps or tumors. And then we have common cold midline plus medical encyclopedia saying common cold usually causes a runny nose nasal congestion, uh, the most common symptoms are, and so on and so forth. All right, so checking an answer is easier than find, finding it. Yeah, I think that's that's the main uh, the main message I want to convey. So if we look at the second one, sinus infection, we also get these uh, you know this paragraph of text: sinusitis or sinus infection occurs when sinuses, nasal passages, and so on and so forth. Acute viral sinusitis called by caused by a virus, and then it says common antibiotics cannot kill the infection. Uh, we have another paragraph here, but keep in mind, uh, notice this one, okay, it says common cold symptoms include nasal congestion, all right. Uh, here we have common environmental factors, okay, in the third entry, in the third paragraph, common environmental factors in, uh, that contribute to sinusitis. Uh, because common cold is a virus appears in the uh, fourth paragraph. All right. So the, uh, and the fifth paragraph has common cause of acute sinusitis is viral infection. So we have these paragraphs, and the point is that we will be now comparing the value of these paragraphs for each of the candidate answers. So uh, the, the paragraphs are sort of uh, the reminder of them is on the left, and some of the questions we would ask would be, is the answer an infection? That is, uh, is the answer of the type infection, because that was the type of the noun phrase that was the question, all right? So well, the answer in both cases would be yes. Is the answer a viral infection? Again, the answer would be yes, but keep in mind that even if the answer is positive in both cases, the amount of evidence doesn't have to be the same. Uh, is the answer nasal infection? Again, the, it, will be, it, it will be positive. Now, uh, the next question is common and modifier of the answer, okay, because, uh, you know, this quotation suggests that common, the word common should be a modifier of the answer. And here there is a difference, yes, there is a difference uh, that, you know, common cold appears as, as a phrase, but uh, uh, common sinus infection is rare. All right, we do not get it in our in our paragraph of text. Uh, even more, the you know the question, the, the 
passages on sinus infection is explicitly mentioned from the cold, so it, it is a negative evidence for, for the sinus infection. Right? And then we can ask the question, you know, how many results do we have for each candidate? So notice that for sinus infection, common nasal infection viral, we get about half a million results. And then for uh, the previous query, common cold nasal infection viral, we get about 4 million results. So that is worth something, yes, as, as a piece of evidence. Obviously, that's not the way Watson worked. But Watson had a proxy for it, that is uh, stuff like uh, search rank and uh, search score, which we do not get from Google. Plus, Watson had another 400 other dimensions that were used to score. So in any case, I mean, the idea here is that, you know, that these kind of questions can be programmed and uh, uh, then the answers to these questions, like, you know, is viral modifying uh, the answer, yes, is common modifying the answer, the number of candidates, all of these can be uh, expressed as numbers, and thus these numbers could be added up to a final score. It would be a weighted sum, not, not a pure uh, sum. So what I would like you to do, and that's behind the homework, is to see if you can replicate this thing programmatically with Bing or Google. That is, you know, get these answers and then create, uh, you know, some elements of uh, getting these passages and possibly writing a very simple passage score. That would be, you know, that's what's behind the homework. And that's where we, how we're going to proceed in class. So the idea would be, going back to this Watson architecture, that we will start the questions, we will do the search on both local and internet sources, we're going to generate some candidates, and then we're going to go back and score these, I mean, and uh, get paragraphs supporting evidence, and then score these paragraphs, and combine the evidence using a machine learning model, and we'll see how we perform. So I think this is uh, all I have for today. If you have some additional questions, you can ask them either uh, by the speaking or by sending the text. So thank you very much. Dziękuję. So there is a question. Do you think that videos of Coursera are worth watching? Yes, they are. That there is a bunch of very good classes. Any, any other questions? Oh, wait, there's another question. I have the question to the person who asked about AI. They were mentioned using biotechnology. All right, so... And I am supposed to reveal the, the names of people who ask the question. 
uh, I don't know how biotechnology would be involved. You know what? This is a good discussion among that should happen among students. Uh, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about what I know uh, how biotechnology could be involved. So uh, there is uh, there is there are two efforts on using supercomputers for biological simulation of brain. Right? So one of them is uh, at IBM in Almaden and the other is at a Polytechnic in Switzerland. Okay? Uh, they focus on somewhat different tasks and the idea behind the computational underlying brain message processing and brain architecture, then possibly we would understand better what sort of facts of process the information. And uh, I might have a slide on that somewhere, but I have to find it. But the names of the people are, okay, so if you look Henry Markram and Damendra Moda, I think that's gonna So the first person is Henry Markram, he's a professor at EPFL, and Damendra Moda is an IBM fellow uh, in the research lab. So these two guys do very interesting work on modeling the brain, but uh, they differ. Differ. So Markham is more interested in sort of modeling the global process of information passing at uh, scale and in parallel and so on and so forth. Uh, next question, what about gene databases? How could NLP be involved in gene analysis? What is the biggest achievement in this field? The answer is uh, I have no idea. All right, I mean, the work on uh, uh, connecting to the gene database that is to understand, you know, what is known out of gene expression interaction based on the published articles. But uh, when it comes, uh, say, to analyzing of gene sec sequences, I don't know if natural language processing technique can have any. There is a student here, NCC, interested in this question, but uh, he, didn't, he doesn't have an answer either. So I guess there isn't that much uh, that is clear about about the role. And I certainly don't think it's such. 